we have Sometimes you have forests without coal, so 
sometimes you get extraction land without forest. So, no. but the forest existed. It must be everything at the same place. Because that is a bit weird, but said, okay. If this is what you want, let's go. They took all the country. Finally, they find a suitable place. By the way, the Koreans never told the Mongols why exactly they did it that way. They said, we are going to talk when we start the negotiations. And first, we must find a place. They find it. Like 500 kilometers from the capital, Ulaanbaatar. Now, now the Koreans start talking. The Mongols are not happy. In fact, they are completely surprised, dumbfounded, shocked, whatever. Any synonyms you can imagine, we take it. The Koreans said, this is how we see the idea of economic cooperation. The raw materials we have here, now we need the human capital. The human capital we will provide. We will send the technical experts. All right. This is the Mongols expecting. What they did not expect, and uh, that the Koreans said, okay, all their families, their whole family should also come. So exactly how many Koreans you want to bring to our country? 80,000. Is it absolutely necessary? Yes, necessary. Okay. This was the first uh, request. If you can put it as a request. Uh, the Koreans went for that. They said, okay. Uh, we found the right place. Very good. Uh, something is missing. The reality. There is no railway. You should build it. I mean, the Mongols should build it. At your, your, own at your own expense, by this deadline. I don't speak about North Korean territory. The Mongolian territory, the Mongolian government should build a railway for the North Koreans of the ground. In the first period, you should provide our workers and families with food and flats and everything. Okay. We, we are going to pay a rent for using your territory. But for the rent, we also want something. Of course, we will exploit the timber, fine. We will exploit the salt, salt the coking coal, or uh, we are going to produce agriculture. But since we already have the land for our use, we also want to do everything else what we want to do. If we want to do hunting, we want authorization for hunting. If we want fishing, we will fish. If you want to find anything other worth mining, we will mine it. Okay, right. And after it, whatever we find, we will bring out of the country. <laughs> so the Mongols listened patiently and said, we are going to think about the, about the issue. So this happened in, as I said, 1968, spring or June. The Mongols were thinking about the issue for approximately 20 years after. They never told the North Koreans flat into the face what they told us. They said, we are interested in the economic cooperation with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. But we are not interested in creating a Korean Autonomous Republic on the uh, soil of our country. For the sake of friendship, they never told this in the face of the North Korea. They always said, we are going to study the issue further, further, further. So it, it is a kind of very interesting case that North Koreans come back to the issue again and again, periodically, but always, almost, and almost always along the same lines. So both sides are extremely persistent. The Mongols were saying no, without saying no. And the Koreans were not trying to do anything else which may be more palatable to the Mongols. So eventually, in the late 80s, then finally the Mongols are a bit more, co more cooperative. And then unfortunately, the Cold War comes to an end, so that whole business just collapses before it starts. So it tells you something about a lot of issues. First, it tells that how North Korean economic nationalism worked. Because usually, uh, we perceive North Korean economic nationalism as something trying to be independent from a stronger country, from Soviet Union, from China, whatever. But it also means that 
if they could have had their way, then they would have preferred to interact with a smaller, not territorial smaller, but in terms of GDP and development, weaker partner in a way we can our way and basically want to isolate our economy in cloud from the Mongolian economy and escape to control from the Mongolian side as possible. So it is a kind of interesting situation, almost a kind of agriculture mining colony in a foreign country, which has similarities with how their logging operations were in the Soviet Union or how their workers live as well. But then they felt, OK, you cannot tell this kind of request to the Soviet Union. They will just pass it to your face. But with a smaller country or weaker country, you may try effectively go for the big one. So this is the first important implication. But this is something more. Why they wanted to do that? Well, there is an important reason, which is almost completely missing. Uh, from the studies on Mongolian and Northern relationship, what we have. It's really the big international picture. You can see very clearly that if you look in the long term, that whenever the North Koreans were really interested in this kind of economic cooperation with Mongolia during the Cold War, it was almost always influenced by the dynamics of Sino-Soviet relations and North Korean economic relations with these countries. So, very uh, shortly before this issue, the North Koreans had three serious economic negotiations, both with China and the Soviet Union. China had the Cultural Revolution and had increasingly bad relations with North Korea. So the Chinese said one good way to make the North Koreans suffer a bit to send them less coal, I mean coffee coal. Because North Korea has anthracite, which is very good, but it has no coffee coal or at least not enough, so they need to import. The Chinese decided to put that the pressure on them, no coffee coal, sorry. Our workers have no time for it, sorry. So the Soviets have asked few to get, the North Koreans asked the Soviets for coal, but not enough. At least not as much they want. And anyway, you cannot play this hardball ball with the Soviets. They decide the Mongolians should help us out. We should uh, feel the gap in a way that then they cannot squeeze us. You know? Because if the Chinese don't want to supply, they don't supply whatever we can do, they are not going to, to you know, yield. But with Mongolia, we, we can do. So you see then this aspect. But what you can see from the story and that the Mongols were really badly split between uh, two contrasting urges. The first was to tell the Koreas that we are not your slaves, sorry. On the other hand, the whole incident happens in a period which helps to understand when Soviet North Korean relations are improving, Chinese North Korean relations are going down, and the Mongols just hate China in this period. They would start, they would continue hating them for two more decades. So the Chinese feel it's politically incorrect and mostly impolite to shoo away the North Koreans precisely when they are coming closer to us. So for the sake of social friendship, we should be nice to them, even if they are capitalist exploitative. So they don't tell them directly that you are not needed with this kind of idea. And you should yeah, like, uh, bring yourself a peg down when you talk to us because we are not your serfs and whatever. So it is a very interesting case in many ways that how a relationship can be influenced by many different factors. But there are other examples which show that how both countries acted toward the other, not simply on the logic of a bilateral relationship, but <coughs> taking some other factors in, in your consideration 
sometimes without the other country even knowing that why you are doing this or that. So there were really some kind of very curious incidents. One was, okay, this time I knew I did uh, something in favor of the Mongols and of the North Koreans, but then I will try to restore the balance. This event was in 76. And that, that at that time, there was a diplomat at the Mongol Embassy in Georgia uh, who was fluent enough in Korean language uh, to do some translated work. Specifically, he translated the most Korean literary work, a title back to some, a whole life of Kathy, which was written uh, by a North Korean poet already dead by that time. Died in 1951 by the name of Joki Chong. So you would see this is real friendship when you translate uh, the literary work of your friend. You would believe the North Koreans were not at all. In 1976, uh, the Mongolian charged their affairs with someone uh, to their foreign ministry. And some kind of relatively high rank guy or department I had as a member tells him very rudely, your attaché, this guy called Rujin Mundell, he badly translated our very important literary work. It should be corrected, mind you. It was published in Mongolia three years before. He badly translated it. He insulted our great leader. It should be correct. The Mongols should correct the translation, print it again, distribute it again, quickly. The Mongols said, is it really important? Yes, it is. <laughs> we give you this deadline. By this deadline, you should give a positive answer, all else. The Mongols decide not to say anything. They really feel perplexed by the whole situation. They figured it out, actually, what the issue was about on the face of it. Because the North Koreans, well, they tempered a bit with the text, to put it mildly. Because the poet, fortunately or unfortunately, died in the Korean War long before. He died in 51. So that time, uh, Sun is still alive. And you cannot read without Mr. Stalin to his face. So, Joki John knows where the wind is blowing. He writes about a kind of literary work about the liberation of Korea from Japanese rule. He will write in a way which shows very clearly that the Soviets did a great work, but also he will say, must be mentioned as one of the conquering or reconquering or liberating heroes. He looks very big, but he doesn't comment the whole scene. That time, it was fun. Later, however, Kim Il-sung started to reinterpret history creatively. In fact, early, like, uh, I think it was in the 60s when they decided, post-facto, post to to rewrite back to Sun. This time, the Soviets get, like, regularly reduced. Kim Il-sung gets bigger and bigger. Now they publish it again. The Mongols knew about both versions. But uh, that time Mongo is so close to the Soviet Union that if you publish the second version, it's like something which the Soviets would very badly resent. Who, of course, never published the second version, only the first. So the Mongo decide, let's publish the first one. But the North Koreans feel this is an insult. They said, you slightly our great leader in favor of others. Others, this is the Soviets. The point is, however, the Mongols did mention. If it's so important, why on earth that you check the translation for three years and now you tell it to us? So, to understand why it was, it's easier to see uh, that the North Koreans were working hard to find such an issue. Previously, they picked on the Soviet maps. That why you don't depict back to Sun uh, uh, as Korean territory. 
the Soviet said, uh, you know why. So they desperately tried to find some fault with the Soviets, with the East Europeans, with whomever, just to show partly to the Chinese benefit, partly that, that we are want to distance ourselves from the Soviet bloc. Eventually, the Mongols, without their knowledge, provided the pretext because their unfortunate and attaché translated something which they could pick up on. So they kicked him out of the country. They said, you are personal grata. So these two episodes are kind of